not a student, but you get extra credit. <laughs> or 220 years young. Uh, we want to welcome you to this event tonight. Uh, this is one of our continuing efforts at civics education. Uh, the James Madison Institute, uh, we're a little over 20 years old, not nearly as old as the Constitution, but uh, we're in our first year of a, a civics education initiative targeting high school students. And uh, last spring we did a James Madison Day lecture. Uh, and then this is the second part of our lecture series, and we've also been working with Boys Day and Girls Day. We're working with teachers in uh, Broward and Palm Beach County, teaching teachers how to teach civics, all based on the founding principles. So uh, this lecture tonight is, is part of our civics initiative, and we want to thank all of you for joining us. If there are high school students here with us tonight, if you um, want us to sign something for you, your teachers will give you extra credit for being here. And extra credit is always a good thing. Um, college students, if you want extra credit, give it a shot. But uh, anyway, please uh, make yourself at home. We have light refreshments over here, and we have two information tables um, with materials from the Federalist Society as well as the James Madison Institute. So we're looking forward to a great evening, and again, thank you for coming. Uh, before we get started, I wanted to ask uh, Jesse Dyer. Jesse? Jesse is a junior at Florida State University and a former James Madison Institute intern. And if you'll stand with us, we're going to have Jesse lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. And uh, Eric Junta is the president of that chapter. And I'm going to turn it over to Eric, and he will introduce Justice Polston. Thank you again. Good evening. My name is Eric Junta, and I am honored to serve as president, as, as you just heard, of the FSU Law Chapter of the Federalist Society for Law and Public Policy Studies. Those of you who are unaware, the Federalist Society is the nation's premier fellowship of law school conservatives and libertarians, who, despite our uh, variegated stances on controversial social issues, are united by the conviction that the authentic way to interpret constitutional and statutory law is through the, the, the philosophy of originalism. Now, for those who are unfamiliar with the legal philosophical jargon, uh, this simply means that laws duly promulgated actually mean what they say, and what they were understood to say at the time when they were promulgated. In some circles, this is called our right-wing extremism. Um, for the rest of us, it's uh, called common sense. In short, the Federalist Society is founded on the principles that the state exists in order to preserve freedom, that the separation of governmental powers is central to our Constitution, and that it is emphatically the province and duty of the judiciary to say what the law is, not what it should be. I want to take now this time to thank um, my officers who could not be here who helped me in the uh, coordination of this event. Uh, Mr. Michael J. Quinn was our Vice President, and Jason Zaffer, who is our Treasurer. Also, a word of thanks um, to Mr. Bill Maddox of the James Madison Institute, who also was my uh, chief collaborator in organizing uh, the speaker this evening. Also, a word of thanks to Mr. Daniel Nordby, who is the president of the Tallahassee Lawyers Chapter, who helped us to get the word out to the local legal, legal uh, institutions and communities about our event. Now allow me to introduce you to the reason why you're all here, uh, Supreme Court Justice Ricky Polston. Justice Polston is one of the newer members of the Florida Supreme Court, having been appointed by Governor Charlie Crist just over, sorry, just under one year ago. Before then, he had served on the first district court of appeal from 2001. Justice Polston, I am proud to say, is an FSU law grad, earning his JD with high honors. And I'll just conclude this very brief biographical overview with uh, what I think is his most amazing accomplishment. With his wife, Deborah, he has raised and is raising 10 children. And so, uh, without further ado, and here to tell us why the First Amendment is the greatest constitutional issue facing our nation at the moment, it is my highest honor to present to you Supreme Court Justice Ricky Polson. Thank you. 
College of Law Federal Society for asking me to be here tonight. I'm always honored to be here at the FS, FSU Law School, and I extend my thanks to Dean Winder and the administration at the school for hosting the event. I'd like to thank Gina Peretti, my intern from the Florida Coastal Law School, who has helped me over the last several days by doing tremendously good research on this topic, and I appreciate her good work. I always need to explain why we have 10 children. Uh, or at least I feel compelled to explain it. Uh, we have four uh, biological daughters uh, who are older now, 26, 24, 22, and 20. And we have adopted a sibling group of six boys from the state foster care system. So that's why we have 10 children. They are uh, a lot of fun. A lot of hard work, and I'm proud to say and the oldest brother, Kevin, is here tonight. He is a junior at Child's High School. How many high school students are here tonight so I can get the lay of the land here? Raise your hand, please, if you're from high school. Good number. What about the number of law students? Okay. What about college students but not in law school? Wow. Okay. Excellent. Uh, welcome. I appreciate you being here. Let me jump right into this important subject matter. Uh, the First Amendment to the United States Constitution, and I'd like to tell you why it is I believe it's the most important constitutional issue facing our country at this particular point in time. But first, there are two important disclaimers I'd like to tell you about. And first, what I'm presenting tonight are reasons why I believe the First Amendment is particularly important and relevant to the country as a whole. Of course, there are many other constitutional provisions, and in no way do I treat our Florida Constitution and the United States constitutional provisions with short shrift. If a person is deprived of a different constitutional protection, that one may be important individually to that particular person at that time. If a person has no uh, food but has clothes, then they're concerned about food, obviously. If they have food but no clothes, they need some clothes. I understand that. People have individual needs, and I don't mean to diminish that there may be other very important constitutional claims other than different provisions, under the different provisions in our U.S. and Florida constitutions. Second, I'm not wearing a robe. You've noticed that, right? Tonight, I'm not making any judgments on cases that may come before the court. Every case must be individually considered on the facts and the law, and I make no judgments on the facts that I have mentioned here tonight. I bring, bring them up to put the First Amendment in the context of today's events so that you can see the relevance of the Constitution to what's happening every day in our society right now. First, the text. The First Amendment states, quote, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of government, of grievances. Although the text refers to Congress, the U.S. Supreme Court has interpreted it as applying to the executive and judicial branches and has held that the due process, clause, due process clause of the 14th Amendment applies its limitations to each state, including any local government within a state. So even though the text says Congress, the U.S. Supreme Court has said no, it applies to the states as well and also to any local governments. The First Amendment, historically, along with the other Bill of Rights, was ratified by 